So your next question might be, do we have enough money? Well, yes we do. But where? So let's take a look. First, let's take a look at healthcare. There is currently 60 billion in Medisafe, of which only 768 million was used in a year. This represents only 1.3%. In MediShield, there is a surplus of 850 million, of which only 282 million was used in a year. This represents only 33%. In MediFund, there is a capital of $3 billion, of which only 100 million was used in a year. This represents only 3.2%. This means that in the total 3M amounts, there is almost 64 billion inside, of which only 1.2 million was used, which is only 1.8%. And because of the low expenditure, what the government spends on healthcare is only 30% of the total health expenditure. Now, if the government was to just spend 10% of the total 3M amounts, the government would be able to increase their expenditure on health to 70% or what is the average of what the governments in the other high-income countries are actually spending. Now, the total health expenditure in Singapore in 2011 was 13.1 billion, of which Medisafe only takes up 5.5%. MediShield only takes up 2.1%, and MediFund only takes up 0.7%. Singaporeans have to spend more than 60% out of pocket, and government subsidies only account for 30%. And if you look at it, the government subsidies only amount to 6% of the total 3M amounts. Now this means that what Singaporeans are paying into healthcare is way and above what the government is spending. So, so the government might be collecting taxes and they might be collecting our MediSafe contribution and MediShield premiums. But what are they actually spending and are they spending anything? Next, we look at CPF. The interest rates that Singaporeans get for our CPF is between 25 to 4%. Now, it is known that our CPF is invested in the reserves. And our reserves are invested by the GIC and Tomasic Holdings. GIC earns 6.5% interest since inception. Tomasic Holdings earns 16% interest since inception. Now, if you look at how much a medium income earner would be able to save based on the current interest rates, a, me a medium income earner would be able to save $700,000 when he or she retires at 65. However, if the interest earned by the GIC and Tomasic is channeled back into our CPF and we are earning the interest rates that we should rightfully be earning, say at 7.5%, the medium income earner would be able to save $2.8 million in our CPF, which means that more than half of Singaporeans should be millionaires by the time we retire. But do you see that happening? Next, the total balance in our CPF as of September 2013, is 248 billion, of which Singaporeans only withdrew 11 billion last year. Now, it has been much said that CPF is our money. Well, now if that's the case, why is there such a huge balance in the CPF? Shouldn't the money actually be returned to us in the first place? If the money is not returned to us, where is it going? Now, again, it is known that the CPF is invested in the reserves. And the three agencies which manage our reserves are the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which has $320 billion, Tomasic Holdings, which has $215 billion, and GIC, which has $360 billion. In total, our reserves would have accumulated $1 trillion, and our CPF has helped to earn this $1 trillion. Now, if indeed CPF is our money, where is our money? Our reserves have $1 trillion, but how many Singaporeans are able to meet the CPF minimum sum? And how many Singaporeans are able to take their CPF out and retire? And we still see many older Singaporeans working as cleaners in our hawker centres, food courts and toilets. But are they able to retire? Meanwhile, in our reserves, there is $1 trillion, which our CPF has helped to earn. So is our CPF our money? Now think again. Next, let's look at housing. Now, if we look at a four-room HDB flat, which costs about $250,000, the construction cost for the flat would take up about 40% of the cost, which is about $100,000. 
And as most of us would know, the land in Singapore is obtained by the government for next to nothing. What this means is that if we are paying $250,000 for our HDB flat and the construction cost is only $100,000, the government is earning $165,000 on each four-room flat that we buy. Next, let's turn our attention to education. It was recently revealed that the government spends $210 million in tuition grants for international students. It was also revealed that the government spends $36 million per year per cohort for scholarships for international students. What this means is that in a year, the government would spend at least $144 million per year on scholarships for international students. Now, if you add this all out, it would add up to about $400 million every year that the government spends for international students for their education. Now, if this $400 million was given back to Singaporeans, it would enable all Singaporean university undergraduates to receive free education. It would enable all pre-university students before preschool to receive free education. It would also enable all preschool Singaporean children to have free education. Now, if the government is so willing to spend $400 million for international students, shouldn't the government spend this money on Singaporeans first before they spend it for international students? Finally, we look at transport. Now, if you look at how much SBS Transit and SMRT has been collecting in fare and non-fare revenue, it has been rising over the years. But if you were to look at the operating expenses of SBS Transit and SMRT, you will see that their operating expenses are actually lower than the revenue that they collect. What this means is that every time there is a transport fare hike, whatever fare hike is more than enough to cover for the operating expenses for the transport operators. In fact, the fare and non-fare revenue is 113% more than what the operating expenses are. Now, if this is the case, if Singaporeans are already paying more into fare and non-fare revenue, and we are paying more than what it takes for the transport operators to run, is there still a case for the annual transport fare hikes? Finally, from 2000 to 2013, SBS Transit and SMRT has made a total of 2.6 billion profits. A few years ago, the government has given these transport operators 1.1 billion to buy buses. However, if they are already making $2.6 billion in profits, can these transport operators purchase the buses from the profits that they already earn? And even if they take $1.1 billion out from their profits, they would still have $1.5 billion in profits left over. So if this is the case, is there a justification for fair hikes? And, and on top of that, Singaporeans are paying taxes to the government. And if these taxes are not coming back to Singaporeans in terms of subsidies for our fares, why are we paying these taxes? So at the end of it, the question that we have to ask is, are Singaporeans being treated fairly? And are Singaporeans being taken advantage of? So now we have shown you that Singaporeans don't actually pay low taxes. In fact, we pay as much as the citizens in the Nordic countries do. Yet the government gives back the lowest in social protection and a lot lower than what the government should be giving back. In short, Singapore has one of the highest prices in the world, while Singaporeans earn the lowest wages among the high-income countries, which means that our purchasing power is also very low. But in addition to paying taxes, Singaporeans are also paying out of pocket for public services like healthcare, education, transport, housing and retirement. So what this means is that not only are Singaporeans paying more than what we should, we are actually double paying for these public services. Now if the government is making us pay more than what we need to, yet they are not giving back what they should and at the same time they are earning the money from us. Why are we paying taxes? And why are we not getting the subsidies back? Why are prices so high? Now, if you look at the other countries, the higher the GDP per capita, the higher the government spending on public services. Yet, the PAP fails on all accounts. The public spending by the government on public services is very low, even though Singapore's GDP per capita is one of the highest in the world. Now, I'm very worried. If indeed we are paying very high taxes in Singapore, and we are also double paying, 
yet we are not getting the social protection and the subsidies back for the government. Is there a need for the government to be accountable and transparent to Singaporeans on how the money that is collected from Singaporeans is being spent?